Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you out in the house of the Lord. Welcome to our online viewers as well. Let's take our Bibles. We're going to be in two places today. Luke 21. We're continuing in our study through the Gospel of Luke. And we're in chapter 21 this morning. But if you want to get a head start, you can also look up Ezekiel chapter 38. We'll be in both of those places. Luke 21, we'll start there. And then if you have a piece of paper or something handy, you can also bookmark Ezekiel chapter 38. I'm going to start in Luke 21 at verse 7 down through verse 28. Jesus has a lot to say about things related to the end times just prior to his second coming. That's what Luke 21 is all about. And so Luke 21, starting at verse 7, says, So they asked him, the disciples asked Jesus, saying, Teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? And he said, Take heed that you not be deceived. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And the time is drawn near. Therefore do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. And then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. You will be betrayed, even by parents and brothers relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience, possess your souls. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. And then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her, for there are the days of vengeance. These are the days of vengeance. That all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. I've entitled today's teaching, The Rise of Russia and the End Times. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you, Lord, thankful for your word. Thankful, Lord, that you are with us because you tell us in your word where two or more are gathered, there you are in our midst. So we we thank you, Lord, for being here with us. We trust that you are glorified through our worship. And now also, as we study your word together, give us wisdom, give us understanding about these things that we're reading. And may we be wise about our times. And we love you, Lord, and we thank you that you first loved us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone said, amen. Well, we've been making our way through the Gospel of Luke for many weeks now. And it just so happens that we come here to Luke chapter 21. And Luke chapter 21 deals extensively, much like Matthew 24, with end time events. Things that are going to be happening in the earth that are prophesied in the Bible just prior to the second coming of Jesus. Now, for those of you who are new to church or maybe unfamiliar with your Bibles, uh, let me just briefly explain. The Bible says that Jesus is coming again. 
We refer to it as his second coming or his return. And just as the Bible was accurate regarding the prediction of his first coming, you can believe that the Bible is also at, uh, uh, accurate when it comes to predicting his second coming. Uh, the Bible says that his second coming will be on a day and at an hour when we do not expect him. And a day and an hour that nobody knows. And when he comes again, he will not come again to die on the cross again. He will come again to bring salvation to all who have waited for him. Hebrews 9 verse 28 says this, Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. How many of you are eagerly waiting for Jesus? And so even though we do not know the day or the hour, we should be prepared at least to know the signs of the times. This is why Jesus says what he does here in Luke 21. And again, similarly, Matthew records it in chapter 24. Jesus says there are various things that are going to happen in the earth. There are various signs and wonders. There are, are various events that will happen. Some of them uh, natural disasters. Some of them man-made disasters. But he says when you see these things increasing, know that these things are what he actually uses this phrase in Matthew 24. These things are birth pains. The earth is going to be in a period of travail. The earth is going to go into a time of intense labor. There will be painful things that will happen on the earth. And Jesus says, but these things are leading up to my imminent return. Now, some uh, people who read Luke 21 uh, and Matthew 24 will make the argument that Jesus wasn't really prophesying beyond the first century AD, that he was uh, predicting things that would happen, that the chaos and the calamity and the destruction of Jerusalem that we just read about here in Luke 21 are simply uh, relegated to events in the first century. Jesus was prophesying about the, uh, the coming of the Roman Empire to destroy Jerusalem in 70 AD. And that certainly did happen. But that cannot be all that he was referring to. It has to be greater than just the Romans who came and destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. Because when Jesus gets through listing all of these events that will transpire prior to his second coming, he ties it all together and he says, now, these things are related to, they're a harbinger of my imminent return. I'll put up on the screens for you again what we read out of verses 27 and 28. Jesus says, then... Like, here's the list, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And he says, now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. So we know that it has to be more than just events in the first century and the persecution that Christians went through with Nero and all of that because that didn't uh, relate to his imminent return. We're still waiting for his return. And thus, when he ties all these things together in Luke 21 by saying here in verses 27 and 28, hey, when you see these things happen, lift up your heads because your redemption is near. I'm coming again. We have to read this chapter and realize that he's giving us a glimpse of things that are to come closer to his return. And so here in Luke 21, like in Matthew 24, these events are what Jesus refers to as birth pains. The earth will go into labor. There will be great times of painful things that begin to happen just prior to the Lord's return. Things will intensify during the period of the tribulation. But we can even get a glimpse of his imminent return related to the turmoil of things that are starting to happen in the earth. And one of those labor pains that he mentions here specifically in what we just read is the increase of wars. He mentions there in verses 9 and 10, he says, but when you hear of wars and commotions, and some translations say, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. And he adds in verse 10, then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So within there, he says, it is to be expected that there are going to be increasing wars on the earth. But at the same time, notice he says, but I don't want you to be terrified. I don't want you to be afraid. These things are going to happen. I got a plan. I'm coming again. So we need to also keep in mind that even though we see things unraveling in our world, that Jesus is 
coming again. Our hope, our blessed hope is in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. We should not be afraid of anything that is happening in the news. Now, we can be concerned on behalf of others. Uh, we shouldn't be, you know, heartless and disengaged. Uh, my heart goes out to the Ukrainian people in this conflict here with Russia. Uh, they were attacked. They were simply uh, attacked. Um, and uh, our hearts go out to the Ukrainian people as we see, like, you know, them hiding in bunkers and children and, and uh, um, fathers and brothers and sons being separated from their families to fight. And it's, it's very hard to watch. Uh, but at the same time, we have to just be mindful of the fact that even though our hearts get heavy with things that we see and hear around the world, Jesus said, these things are, they're indicative that the end is near and I'm coming again. And so right now, the world's attention is on this war between Russia and Ukraine. This is not the first time that Russia has attacked Ukraine. Uh, between the years 1932 and 1933, Soviet Russia invaded Ukraine in what Ukrainians remember still today as Holodomor. Holodomor translates in the Ukrainian language, murder by starvation. In the 1930s, under the leadership of then Joseph Stalin, Stalin ordered the food seizures and literally starved to death an estimated between four to six million Ukrainian people. He literally cut off their food supply to starve them to death. It was pure genocide. Holodomor. And here we are today, an unprovoked attack by Russia and Vladimir Putin against a sovereign nation. Now, Putin would have you to believe that Ukraine is not a sovereign nation. In fact, he gave a speech just a few weeks ago, February the 21st, in which he said, quote, Ukraine has never had its own authentic statehood. There has never been a sustainable statehood in Ukraine. And he argued that Ukraine was a creation of the Soviet Union under Vladimir Lenin, its first leader, and that it is not a legitimate nation. He says it's a fake nation. But that simply isn't true. That's just propaganda. That's just simply propaganda coming out of the Kremlin to justify an invasion. Uh, this past week, I was down in North Carolina speaking at an event with Family Research Council and uh, speaking uh, with me also uh, on the list was uh, a man who's become a good friend of mine, retired now, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin. Uh, General Boykin was the former commander of Delta Force, and he was also the United States Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence under uh, President George W. Bush. And uh, we were talking about this briefly, and he said, Ukraine is absolutely a sovereign nation. And um, I, I learned some things. After the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, Ukrainians were given a choice as to whether or not they wanted to be independent or they still wanted to belong to Russia. And in a 1991 national referendum given to the Ukrainian people, 84% of the eligible voters went to the polls and of those, more than 90% cast ballots for independence. Moreover, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons in 1994, something probably they regret now, but everybody does things trying to, you know, get peace. So the Ukrainians, as part of their sovereignty agreement, gave up their nuclear weapons in 1994 in exchange for recognition of its sovereignty, and Russia signed the agreement. You can look it up. It's called the Budapest Memorandum. Of course, Vladimir Putin is, you know, he's propagating this false narrative that it's a fake country and therefore he justifies attacking them and why? You know, what's in it for Putin? Well, most believe that what's in it for Putin is he just wants to leave, you know, a final swan song. It's his legacy of trying to reunite the former Soviet Union. And he's going after Ukraine, which at one point was part of the Soviet Union, to try to revive the Soviet empire one last time. He already invaded Georgia in 2008, Crimea in 2014, and now it's Ukraine. In an opinion letter in the New York Times, written on March the 6th, Prime Minister of England Boris Johnson 
wrote this, quote, we have failed to learn the lessons of Russian aggression. For too long we have turned the other cheek. No one can say we were not warned. We saw what Russia did in Georgia in 2008. We've been warned, we've seen the evil. And by the way, because of the track record and what Putin is currently doing in Ukraine, the people of Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, Belarus, the Russians are already in Belarus, and Armenia, the people of those countries ought to be very afraid because they also used to be part of the former Soviet Union. And so if Putin is on a mission to try to revive the ancient Soviet Union, he is going to go after those countries as well. And if he can get away with doing what he is in Ukraine, then he's going to be emboldened to do the same in Belarus and Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania and Armenia as well. And in addition, the people of Poland should be afraid. Because if Putin continues to get his way, what's stopping him to take other territories that weren't even part of the Soviet Union previously? There's a foreign ambassador to Russia who has connections with one of my staff members, and uh, he emailed this person uh, yesterday uh, to get a message to us uh, from Moscow. That's where he is embedded as a foreign ambassador. And this is what he wrote about Putin, okay? Quote, what scares me most is that I do not see a way out. I see an angry man who does not care about his people or about his country's economy. He does not even care about his soldiers. He just wants to bring Ukraine under his heel. End quote. And this all happening while the world just watches. And it's sad how disengaged the rest of the world is. A good pastor friend of mine, Jack Hibbs from Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, he sent me a YouTube video uh, the night before last. And it was a video of a, um, of a meeting that he did with uh, Dennis Prager. And the meeting was called uh, Ask a Jew, Ask a Gentile. And uh, Prager's a Jew, and obviously Jack Hibbs is a Gentile, a Christian pastor. And so they were hitting, you know, the issues of the day and uh, from a Jewish standpoint, from a Gentile Christian standpoint. So Jack sent me this video clip of their, of their dialogue, of their interview. And Dennis Prager said something that I think uh, we can relate to. Dennis Prager said this, quote, talking about Ukraine and the whole conflict, the attack from Russia. He said, quote, I totally understand that we can't send our own troops to fight this war. But I feel like I am a powerful man on a street and I'm watching a woman getting raped and I am not doing a darn thing about it. Now, he actually said something stronger than darn, but I filtered it for the sake of kids and my wife, who probably wouldn't want me to say it. <laughs> but I think that that describes how a lot of us feel. Helpless and wondering why isn't something more being done? And what can be done? I mean, short of sending our own troops in, what can be done? I mean, where are the other nations? Where's the outcry? Who will stop this madman? Are sanctions enough? Are they really doing much of anything? And why does it seem, maybe just my opinion, that the United States aid has been too little too late? I mean, we, we should be, you know, General Boykin said to me, he said, you know, we should be giving them every military, artillery, and aid and assistance financially and materially in every way we can to help the Ukrainian people uh, push back this uh, evil assault. And I, I don't know, and so when I heard Dennis Prager say that, I said, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I feel. Like, like we, we, there's power, but we are powerless and we're watching something horrible happen. Just overnight, I got a text this morning, just overnight, the Russians bombed Mariupol and they hit a school in Ukraine where 400 Ukrainians were sheltering, men, women, and children. The casualty has not, the casualty list has not been uh, uh, calculated yet, but um, they continue to be on the rampage and yet, Yet the Ukrainian people are courageous people. 
Ukrainian? Yes, they are. The Ukrainian Customs reports that more than 310,000 men have returned to Ukraine to fight. Men between the ages of 18 and 60, they're taking up arms and they're saying, we're going we're to defend our families, we're going to defend our land, we're going to defend our country. And God bless President Zelensky. You know, Zelensky is Jewish. And as a Jew, he understands a little bit about persecution. And he understands historically, at least, uh, something about perseverance and something about survival. And may the Lord continue to be gracious to the Ukrainian people and to help them in this attack, which is nothing less than pure evil. What Putin is doing is pure evil. Do you know what's interesting? In the Hebrew language, the word in Hebrew for a wicked man or an evil man, are you ready for this? The word in Hebrew for a wicked man or an evil man is Russia. It is spelled differently. In English, it is spelled R-A-S-H-A, but phonetically, it sounds the same, Russia. It's the Hebrew word for an evil man. Putin is an evil man. And the Bible tells us that Russia is the primary player in the end time events leading up to the return of Christ. And if not now, at some point, Russia will gather other nations. And I submit to you that they will either gather these nations through alliance or through dominance. But one of those is going to happen because the Bible says, and I'm going to take you there to Ezekiel 38, that Russia will bring together nations either by alliance or dominance and they will converge against Israel in the end times. This is what the Bible predicts. Go to Ezekiel 38 now if you haven't already turned there. Ezekiel chapter 38 in your Old Testaments. And I want you to see the dominant role that Russia plays leading up to the events of the end times. And then we'll try to sort through all this and make some sense of it. In Ezekiel 38, I'll read the first six verses and then I'm going to jump to verse 14. But here we start Ezekiel 38 verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all its troops, the house of Tagarma from the far north, and all its troops, many people are with you. Jump down to verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hollowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. So God predicts here through the prophet Ezekiel that he will allow, because this is all part of his providential plan to display his power and his might, because he will subdue do these armies that come against Israel, but he will allow these armies from the far north. Now, if you look at a map, Moscow is almost exactly due north of Jerusalem. And these different nations from Europe and led by this Russia, Iranian confederation, we'll see this in a moment, I'll, pa I'll unpack these verses. They're going to converge against Israel in the end times. And so what we read here in Ezekiel 38, Ezekiel names six not really countries because the borders are, you know, different over periods of, you know, uh, centuries, but basically six territories or six regions that will come against Israel. And the first region he lists here in verse 2, if you look at your Bible, circle the word Gog. Gog in Hebrew is not a location, it is a title. Gog can be translated prince 
or czar or president. This is a title of an individual. So it refers to a person. And this person is prince over Magog. That's the other word there in verse 2. Now, historians through the centuries, Herodotus is one of them. Herodotus would write in the 5th century B.C., And Josephus and Pliny would write in the first century AD, and they would all say the same thing, that Magog is the ancient land of the Scythians. The Scythians occupied the territory north of the Black and Caspian Seas. We're talking Russia. Magog is Russia. This has historically been noted through the centuries. And it mentions here, in addition to Magog, it says Rosh in verse 2. Now, some of your Bibles translate, instead of saying Rosh, it translates it literally, which is chief. Uh, So, Rosh has to go with Gog, meaning this is a chief prince of Magog. This is an individual who has supreme authority in the land of Russia over, notice also verse 2, Meshach, which uh, scholars believe is a reference to Moscow, and to Baal, to Baal in verse 2 is an ancient name for Tobolsk. Tobolsk is in west central Russia. It used to be the Siberian oil capital. And so all of verse 2 refers to Russia. They are the lead. They take the lead in joining with other nations or other territories to assault Israel in the end times, just prior to the second coming of Jesus. And joining Russia in this confederation are five other territories or regions or countries. The first on the list in verse 5, if you look in your Bibles, first on the list is none other than Iran. Now, it is listed there in verse 5 as Persia, okay? Because Iran has always been known as Persia up until 1935. 1935, Persia was changed to Iran. But we're talking Iran here. And everybody knows that Vladimir Putin has a cozy, comfortable relationship with the Iranian president, Hassan Rouhani. And um, they are on a mission. And they have Israel and the United States in their crosshairs. Uh, Until the Islamic Revolution of 1979, Iran used to be an ally of the United States and of Israel, by the way. Before 1979, the Shah of Iran was selling oil to Israel. That's how much they got along. Not any longer because of the uh, Islamic Revolution of 1979. Uh, Russian National Security Council Secretary Nikolai Petrushev recently said this, quote, in the context of the statements made by our partners with regard to a major regional power, namely Iran, I would like to say the following. Iran has always been and remains our ally and partner. Well, that's not true. They've never been allies until recently. But it wouldn't be the first time propaganda came out of the Kremlin. But anyway, he goes on to say, with which we are consistently developing relations both on bilateral basis and within multilateral formats. Well, the translation, we have a nuclear arms agreement. Uh, In the last four to five years, Russia and Iran have negotiated a $10 billion arms deals, allowing Iran to purchase T-90 tanks, artillery systems, and aircraft from Moscow that are expected to keep the Islamic Republic fully armed over the next many years. And all of this is setting the stage for the events that are mentioned here back in the book of Ezekiel. So notice again verse 5, after joining this Russian confederation, uh, in addition to Iran, comes verse 5, Ethiopia and Libya with them. Now, in some of your Bibles, Ethiopia is translated with the original Hebrew name for it, Cush. Cush is Ethiopia, and it also represents part of northern Sudan. And we're talking Islamic states here, because 45% of Ethiopia is Sunni Muslim, 70% of Sudan is Sunni Muslim. In addition to Ethiopia, or Cush, on the list in verse 5, is Libya. And some of your Bibles translate the Hebrew put, P-U-T. Libya is uh, 97% population Sunni Muslim. So basically we're talking here, Ethiopia and Libya represent the Islamic states of the upper Nile region of Africa. They too will join this confederation and they will come against Israel. In addition, look at verse 6. You have Gomer. And this is no relation to Andy Griffith for those of you who are old like me. Those of you who are younger, I have no idea what that reference is. It's okay. 
But Gomer is a word that defines the territory. Now listen, this is where it gets very interesting because this has everything to do with what's happening right now. Gomer is the territory of Eastern Europe. The territory of Gomer would include Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, and Ukraine, all countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union. In addition, Gomer also would include the area of Poland. Now, keep this in mind because these are the nations that come together to go against Israel. And not only the territory of Gomer, but also Beth Togarma or the house of Togarma. Beth Togarma is the region of Armenia and Georgia. It's also the territory of Turkey. If you've been following your news, Turkey is moving away from NATO and they're aligning themselves more with Russia. It's happening right now. So when you look at this, the Eastern Bloc of nations between the territory of Gomer and Tagarma, which include again, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, Armenia, uh, Belarus, Ukraine, Georgia, these are all territories of the former Soviet Union. So could it be that what we're seeing starting to happen is with Putin's desire to potentially reunite the former Soviet Union, that he is not just, you know, gathering these nations by way of an alliance to go march against Israel eventually, but perhaps he's doing it by means of dominance, taking these territories, because the Bible specifically says these are the territories and regions of nations that will come against Israel in the latter days. Now, I want to say a few things in the, in the few minutes we have left. Ezekiel 38, what we're reading here, is not about the Battle of Armageddon. It's not. What we're reading about in Ezekiel 38 is a military campaign that, when you look at all the context of Scripture, indicates to us that this military campaign starts at the beginning of the tribulation period. It is likely that this military campaign lasts the duration of the tribulation. It's a seven-year military campaign that culminates with the Battle of Armageddon. By the time you get to Armageddon, you see other nations coming from other parts of the world to join this Russia, Iranian, uh, Turkey, confederation of nations that come from the north. You also have kings coming from the east because this answers the question that some of you might have, what about China? Where's China in this mix? Well, China shows up in the Battle of Armageddon. So it seems that what Ezekiel 38 is talking about is the formation of this military campaign. It's part of the birth pains. It's part of when Jesus is coming again. It's the things leading up to his return. They form this military campaign at the beginning of the tribulation. It, it endures for seven years and culminates with Armageddon, at which point other nations join them. Among them is China. Listen to Revelation 16, verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl in the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And then a few verses later says, And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Har Megiddo, or Armageddon. So the Bible tells us that part of the end times during the period of the tribulation will be that the Euphrates River dries up, this great barrier between the Middle East and the Far East. And when the Euphrates River drives up, dries up, then China, the whole Pacific Rim, will come across the land to join with the Russian-Iranian Confederation and converge against Israel in the Valley of Megiddo at Armageddon. This is what the Bible predicts. So again, it should be no surprise to us that Russian President Vladimir Putin is also chummy with Chinese President Xi Jinping because they have the same ambition. And why is it also that China has not been outspoken against Russia for their invasion and attack of Ukraine? Because they're cut out of the same cloth. And, you know, people are alarmed at China potentially trying to do the same thing to Taiwan. Well, if you're going to do the same thing to Taiwan, you're not going to criticize somebody doing this to Ukraine. And they have an ambition. That's an evil ambition. But again, this shouldn't, be, this shouldn't surprise us. As Christians, we should not be caught off guard by this. Like there's evil in the world. There are evil dictators. There are evil leaders. Uh, this has been the case historically. It will be the case going forward. This is nothing new. But when we see these things starting to line up, we should perk up. 
And we should be aware, we should be the most informed people on the planet as Christians. Because we have the Bible that gives us a glimpse of some of these things. We shouldn't be surprised and caught off guard. Yes, we should be concerned for people who are caught in the crosshairs of mad people like this. But we should also at the same time realize, okay, Jesus said this is going to, these are the signs of the time. This means we're getting closer to his return. So we need to take heart. We need to lift up our head. Look up. Jesus is coming again. And we should, we should be able to at least process these things through the grid of the Bible to give us comfort and hope. And along those lines, I leave you with four quick points, four quick takeaways. Number one. The current Russian-Ukrainian war is likely part of the birth pains spoken of by Jesus in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. Luke 21, verse 9, Jesus says, But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. So these things should wake us up and realize, okay, this, uh, you know, Russia plays a dominant role in end times prophecy just prior to the second coming of Christ. These are probably the birth pains. I don't think the world is going to, you know, go nuclear, although they have the capability of doing that uh, just now, um, because Jesus said these other things will line up. So this is part of the birth pains. But along these lines, now, before I share point number two, think about this with the timeline of events. If, in fact, Ezekiel 38 that we just read a military campaign begins to form at the beginning of the tribulation period. And the battle of Armageddon is at the end of the tribulation period because that military campaign culminates in the battle of Armageddon. And if you believe as I do that the predominance of the Bible gives us a pre-trib position, meaning the church is taken out before the tribulation actually begins, then we need to understand that there's some parallel things happening here. As we watch the world scene, as we watch, you know, Russia attack Ukraine, and we watch all these different things starting to unfold, and Ru Russia takes a predominant role, and China comes, you know, from the, from the Far East, we should realize that at the same time, we could go at any moment because these things line up on parallel tracks. So it's point number two. Believers will be raptured, taken from the earth prior to the tribulation. And since the Russian military campaign of Ezekiel 38 against Israel starts at the beginning of the tribulation and the battle of Armageddon occurs at the end of the tribulation, it is likely that Christians will not be here for any of this. You say, well, wait a minute, we're, we're here right now. We're seeing the, these are the birth pains. OK, when the delivery actually happens, we will not be here. And if you think you're going to be here, you can have my house and my car because I am out of here. <laughs> Anybody else? And on the way up, I promise I will not look back and say to anybody, told you so. You know, if you want to have a post-trip position, fine. But I'm just telling you, when I look at the Bible, it tells us that he does not want us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so God is ready to take us home. Jesus said, the coming of the Son of Man will be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. What were about the days of Noah and the days of Lot that are similar to our days? Corruption, sin, you know, all of this stuff that's dominating the world scene. But what did God do for Noah and his family? He rescued the righteous before he brought judgment. And what did God do for Lot and his family before he brought destruction to Sodom and Gomorrah? He rescued the righteous before he brought judgment. Jesus is coming again. So even though we might be around for some of these birth pains, when all of this really explodes in the great tribulation of Revelation 6 to 18, we will not be here. And so that's, that's our blessed hope, the imminent return of Jesus to take us home. Number three, I got two more quick points. Number three, when Jesus comes again to end the battle of Armageddon, that's Revelation 19, he will defeat every foe and crush every enemy that sets itself up against God and the nation of Israel. I won't take time to do it here, but I gave you the references. If you look at Ezekiel 38, verses 18 to 23, you compare it with Revelation 16, verses 16 to 21, which talks about the Battle of Armageddon. These two scenes are very similar. That's why it appears that it's a military campaign in Ezekiel 38 that culminates in the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation 16, but that the end result is the same. 
that God destroys these nations that have gathered against Israel and set themselves up against God. When Jesus returns, he will end the war of all wars. He will establish himself once and for all as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Final point, number four. In the meantime, we must keep looking toward heaven because Jesus is coming again. And this is what he told us at the end of the passage we started with, Luke 21, verses 27 to 28. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise his name. <laughs> Paul, when he wrote to Timothy... He closed with these words in 2 Timothy 4.8. He said, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, with which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, on that day that I see him, or when he returns, whichever happens. He says, There is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not to me only, but to all who long for his appearing. Do you long for his appearing, church? I hope you do. He's our hope. He's our Savior. Jesus is coming again. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, for the reminder that you are on the throne. You're coming again. And though our hearts might get heavy by the things we see happening in the earth, we know, Lord, because you tell us these things, that we can await your imminent return. And our hope is in you, Lord. The blessed hope of the church is in your promised return. And so, Lord, we pray in the meantime that you would help us not to be afraid, that we would lift up our heads, lift up our eyes, that we would look to heaven, you're coming again, that we would remind ourselves that this is not our home, that our home in Jesus is with you, Lord. And in the meantime, Lord, as we endure the things of the earth, as we look at the birth pains, uh, may it just prepare us. May we be ready, watching, hoping and looking. And Lord, while we wait and watch, we pray right now for the Ukrainian people, for President Zelensky. We pray, God, for you to give them favor, for you to help them. We pray for the grieving families that have lost loved ones, sons and husbands, brothers and fathers fighting in this war, an unprovoked attack. Lord, we pray that you would push back the forces of evil. It's hard to know exactly how to pray, Lord, because you tell us these things are to be expected. But may you, Lord, at least we pray, minister your comfort and your grace to the people who are caught in the crossfire. Help them, Lord. Minister your grace to them and your peace. Come, Lord, quickly. We look forward to your return, Lord, to be with you forever and ever. You are our hope. We love you and we praise you and we thank you that you first loved us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you all.